Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, Money Matters. Acting State Treasurer Liz Moyo spends her second consecutive day testifying to a legislative budget committee. Preparing those on the autism spectrum for a life without limits. This is a quarter horse named Crude. He's bodacious at the rodeo, all kinds of job skills, and now he's got job security. Plus, when is a wall not a wall? When locals turned it into a work of art. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. The acting state treasurer's budget and tax hike pitch on behalf of Governor Murphy was met by skepticism in the state Senate Tuesday, and today it was met by skepticism in the state assembly from both sides of the aisle. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron was there. Six months ago, Liz Moyo served on the Assembly Budget Committee. Today, she testified before it as acting state treasurer. Having served on your side of the table, I can truly appreciate the challenges you face as you make decisions that will affect our state's residents. Moyo was there to defend Governor Murphy's fiscal year 2019 budget proposal. One flashpoint was the school funding formula. Lawmakers of both parties wondered why Murphy is still using the old, discredited 2008 formula, not the one they tinkered with last summer. The governor stands ready to work with the legislature to amend the formula if that's what uh, the legislature would like to do. These numbers just don't work. And frankly, for the purpose of a new governor coming in, it got off on a very bad foot on the public discussion that I think could have been avoided if there had been a little more back and forth. But the heart of the debate is about taxes and spending. Murphy's budget totals $37.4 billion. That's $2.7 billion over the current year, and it involves raising some taxes. If we were did nothing but tread water in this budget, we would still have a $161 million deficit with no initiatives, um, no revenue raisers. We need, to, we need to bring in additional revenues in the state. Murphy wants to hike the income tax on million-dollar earners and restore the sales tax to 7 percent. It's now at 6.625. The new chair of the Budget Committee, Assemblywoman Eliana Pintor Marine, did not fully embrace the tax hikes proposed by her fellow Democrat Murphy. I don't think myself or the, the members are there yet in the sense that we really have to see um, what's some more clarity in the budget and um, some of these revenue raisers, I mean you heard today, uh, what the projections are really going to be like um, if we will be getting all of what is projected. Republican Budget Officer John DeMeo worries about the additional spending. Not one Part of this discussion has been about what if we have an economic downturn? What does our surplus look like? Can we ride out another storm? I say no. We keep, we keep spending more, taxing more, chasing out the higher income earners. Murphy wants to increase school aid, expand pre-K, increase tuition aid at community colleges, and fund New Jersey Transit. Moyo blamed previous tax cuts for putting those goals out of immediate reach. When we took the billion dollars from the lottery out of general fund, when we took, when we reduced sales tax, that was a hit to the fund. The estate tax being um, sunsetting out, that, that, was, that was all general fund revenue. Republican Nancy Munoz said, why not just fully fund the schools? We have needs across the entire educational spectrum, which is what we're trying to address in this budget. And as I said, we can't, we can't fix it overnight, but we're taking a first step. But, I mean, there's something missing that we, we can't get the money to the K-12 schools that need the money, and yet at the same time, we're starting new initiatives. I mean, it just seems that there's something that's just not right here. Where Democrats see necessary investments, Republicans see excessive spending and misplaced priorities. The debate will go on till the end of June. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. 
The continued grilling of Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg in Washington had a New Jersey headliner standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business with the day's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, on Capitol Hill, it was day two of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg testifying on privacy issues. He went before the House Energy and Commerce Committee, where New Jersey Congressman Frank Pallone expressed frustration over how data security issues continue to happen. We all know the cycle by now. Our data is stolen. The company looks the other way. Eventually, reporters find out, publish a negative story, and the company apologizes. And Congress then holds a hearing, and then nothing happens. By not doing its job, this Republican-controlled Congress has become complicit in this nonstop cycle of privacy by press release. And the cycle must stop because the current system is broken. Pallone is calling for tougher data security laws. During questioning from New Jersey Congressman Leonard Lance, Zuckerberg again apologized for Facebook's privacy lapse, echoing comments from his chief operating officer made last week. We were trying to balance two equities. On the one hand, making it so that people had data portability, the ability to bring their data to another app in order to have new experiences in other places, which I think is a value that we all care about. On the other hand, we also need to balance making sure that everyone's information is protected. And is I think that we, we didn't get that balance right up front. Thank you. I, I, I certainly concur with uh, the statement of the COO, as affirmed by you today, that you got the balance wrong. Meantime, Facebook has set up a special page in its help center for users to find out if their personal information may have been lifted by the research firm Cambridge Analytica. Johnson & Johnson must pay $80 million in punitive damages to a man who claimed he developed cancer due to his exposure to asbestos in talc-based products. Today's decision by the New Jersey jury comes after it awarded the man $37 million in compensatory damages during the first stage of the trial, which concluded last week. This decision marks the first trial loss for New Brunswick-based J&J &J over allegations that products like Johnson's baby powder contain asbestos. The company denied the allegations, saying its powders do not contain asbestos, nor do they cause cancer. The company is fighting separate cases that allege baby powder use is linked to ovarian cancer. New Jersey added 3,600 new jobs in March, but that's down from the prior month when 4,200 jobs were created. The professional and business services sector led the way with job growth in March. A Pennsylvania company is considering relocating to Camden and bringing 65 jobs with it. Union Packaging is also pledging to hire workers who oftentimes have difficulties getting jobs, such as former prisoners. The State Economic Development Authority has approved more than $10 million in tax breaks for the company, which would move to the city next spring. Walmart plans to invest $68 million in New Jersey in the next year. It will expand or remodel more than a dozen stores. The company also plans to open a new location in Mount Laurel this spring, which will bring 300 jobs. On Wall Street, stocks closed lower. The Dow fell 218 points. And those are our top business stories. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The CDC reports the number of children in New Jersey with an autism spectrum disorder is far above the national average. Newark Acting School Superintendent Robert Gregory created the district's first curriculum for autistic students. Michael Hill went for a visit. So nice. Newark school children on the autism spectrum showing how they have fun and entertain at an overcrowded ceremony to mark Autism Awareness Month. Our children are successful, our children are happy, our children are performing, um, and um, they're important. 
Assistant Superintendent Carolyn Granado says this is about giving all kids access to learning, some more mainstream than others, to prepare them for careers in independent living as more kids are being diagnosed with a developmental disorder that shows up as trouble communicating and interacting socially. Granado says the rate is 1 in 42 children in New Jersey. I don't believe we really know the reason it's increasing. A lot of individuals will say it's because of, um, of our diligence in diagnosing it and assisting early on. We know that those the most important time to, uh, to intervene is during those very early years. Antonio Brown was diagnosed when he was five. He used to play with lint balls and all that. And I used to wonder, what's wrong with you, you know? What's, what's, I tried to get him to get out of his shell. What happened when Antonio's parents enrolled him in Newark Public Schools? He wasn't able to hold a pen, a pencil. He wasn't able to write his name. He wasn't really verbal. Um, now that he's been into the program, he's exceeded the goals that we were looking for him to exceed at this point. Okay, let's do that. The Phoenix Center is a nonprofit school for children on the autism spectrum and living with other disabilities. They start at the age of five. They graduate when they're 21. Julie Maurer is the executive director. Each and every one of our students uh, is someone's son or daughter, someone's niece or nephew, someone's very important person in their life. And with that in mind, we, it's our job to uncover all their gifts to respect them highly and to ensure that we are helping the student as well as the family. Show me an object that has the same color as my eyes. The Phoenix Center does that through a lot of tools and props, including robots. You got it, Alexis. <laughs> nice job. Uh -huh. A smart board. Ooh, a turtle. A turtle. Very good, a turtle. 12-year-old Cheney, a Labrador retriever. Hold it here. Don't pull your hand back. A multi-sensory room. The bubble tube, the vis different visual inputs, we're trying to raise her arousal level to get her to be more interactive. We meet the student where they are, and then we try and bring them up or down based on where they are to make it therapeutic for them. The Phoenix Center's philosophy is if you think those on the autism spectrum and others with disabilities have to live a life with limits, then think again. Our individuals with autism, multiple disabilities, they want the fulfilled life that everybody else wants. So it's a matter of us helping for everyone to understand that. See you later, alligator. In Nutley, Michael Hill, NJTV News. Challenges like heart disease and diabetes disproportionately affect people in minority populations. The local chapter of the United Way is holding a symposium aimed at closing the health gap between whites and people of color. Leia Mishkin reports. Welcome. Thank you. Deborah Bird is a volunteer at this United Way event on how to address health disparities through community engagement. But she also has firsthand experience on that topic. I was 298 pounds, diabetic. I went into the hospital because my sugar was 1,095. She says doctors told her she should have been in a diabetic coma or had a stroke. I asked her how it got to that point. Growing up, you ate what did your parents cook for you. Nobody really measured out, you know, you ate whatever you wanted. And when I got older, I ate what I wanted. Seven out of the 10 most impactful uh, diseases that are a downturn to wellness in our communities are impacted and preventable by what we eat. We have to make decisions that we already know, you know. I can't eat cake and ice cream and pie every night because I like it if I've been diagnosed with diabetes. I can't, you know, not exercise because I'm tired when I get home. He says these are decisions we can make that aren't impacted by economics. But economics do play a factor in why New Jersey leads the country in many of the areas of health disparities. When we look at diseases like uh, asthma, which is the number one cause and cost of hospitalization for children. That hasn't gotten better, it's gotten worse, okay? Uh, heart disease, diabetes, these are trends that are overwhelming in the ethnic minority inner city community, and we haven't moved the needle. State health data shows Hispanics are twice as likely as whites to be hospitalized for asthma, and African Americans are four times more likely. It's the same for infant mortality, even though the state has made strides. The data shows African-American babies die at more than three times the rate of white newborns.
there are also major disparities when it comes to obesity. Income, health, uh, ge geography, um, um, race, uh, all of those things play into effect. Anthony Nunez says he's from Newark and his father is diabetic. That's what motivates him to be part of the change. He was diagnosed at 21, but he didn't do anything. He, he literally didn't do anything because of all of those <laughs> factors that determined, you know, his future. It's like he was uneducated. He um, ate whatever he wanted to eat. His, he, he, he was poor. Nunez has helped his father, and he's also the person who trained Deborah Burt to become a peer leader. It's done through United Way's chronic disease self-management program. She says by understanding what she could do to better her situation, like diet, exercise, and portion control, she was able to get her health back together. I was taking 30 units three times a day. Now I take 30 units once a day, and I'm down to one pill instead of three pills. She's 59 years old, a mother of two, and can now say her diabetes is under control. In Newark, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Detecting concussions, that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Upper Saddle River, and a winning team. After a classmate suffered a concussion during football season last year, a team of eighth graders at Cavallini Middle School worked all year to develop software and sensors for football helmets to quickly and more accurately identify potential concussions, which affected some three million people last year. The kids entered their design in a Samsung contest that encourages teachers and students to solve real world problems. They became one of 10 finalists to pitch it to the judges Monday and today learned they'd beat out thousands of school STEM programs to be named one of three national grand prize winners, earning their school $150,000 in new technology. Next to Atlantic City, where a team from the Borgata has rehabbed a house, the hotel, casino, and spa partnered with Habitat for Humanity, and volunteers invested three months and 300 hours painting, renovating, and refreshing the two-story structure on Michigan Avenue. In cutting the ribbon, Borgata president and COO Marcus Glover called giving back to their communities a moral imperative. Habitat's county director said this rehab means someone will be able to provide a home for their family. Finally, New Brunswick, where a Rutgers scholar has played a vital role in the acquisition of an ancient Torah. When the Library of Congress considered purchasing a 10th or 11th century scroll containing the earliest known legible version of the Song of the Sea, Jewish studies professor Gary Rensberg helped to identify its provenance. The roughly two-foot square vellum contains Exodus passages detailing the flight of the Jewish people from Egypt. On the back is an 1860 inscription in both Hebrew and Russian, thought to have been a gift of Crimean, Crimean Jews to the Russian Tsar's brother. Dr. Rensberg recognized it immediately, and it's now on display in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress, beside the first mass-produced book in Western civilization, the Gutenberg Bible. And that's the Garden State Express for Wednesday, April 11th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. The issue of gun violence took center stage at the Rutgers School of Social Work. The discussion led by the former New Jersey governor who signed the nation's toughest ban on assault rifles into law back in 1990. Governor Jim Florio was joined by a panel of scholars and gun safety advocates. His goal, to inspire students to build on the momentum triggered by the school shooting in Parkland, Florida, to change hearts and minds. What we're trying to do is get people to appreciate the common sense that the public interest is not served by having access to weapons of mass destruction, weapons that are really designed to kill as many people as possible. New Jersey is taking a good step in banning assault weapons. We have to lift the level of awareness to do other things that are necessary as well. Just this week, Governor Murphy signed an executive order making data on gun violence more accessible. 
In the wake of reports, school employees accused of sexual misconduct were able to move from job to job without having their records follow them. Governor Murphy has signed a law to put a stop to the practice of so-called passing the trash. It requires school districts, public and private schools, charters, and contracted service providers to review the employment history of prospective employees who'd have regular contact with students to discover any allegations of child abuse or sexual misconduct. Governor Murphy's outpacing his most recent predecessors in early approval ratings. Three months into his tenure, a new Monmouth University poll shows 44% of New Jersey adults approve of the job Murphy's doing. Chris Christie got 41%. John Corzine stood at just 34% three months in. But the poll also shows the public divided on whether Murphy puts governing the state ahead of his own personal ambitions, and some doubt where Murphy's priorities lie. When PSCNG was required to build a new electrical switching station after Hurricane Sandy, Newark leaders asked that it be an aesthetically pleasing one. So PSCNG, an underwriter of NJTV News, built a 48,000 square foot protective facade around it, and local and international artists have now turned it into a 30 foot high art wall. At its unveiling, the mayor said the project created jobs for residents and raised tax revenue for the town, and PSD&G got more reliable infrastructure, a thing of beauty. We leave you in Cowtown, with news practically guaranteed to bring joy to generations of riders, ropers, and barrel racers. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. Cowtown defies modern stereotypes. Founded in 1929, run by five generations of the Harris family, the weekly rodeo show with everything from bulldogging to bronc riding to mutton busting attracts thousands to rural Salem County all summer long. You know, no one would believe that the longest active rodeo in the United States of America is in New Jersey. It's such an iconic property, and I always like the, the slogan, Cowtown, you know, often imitated, never equaled. And today, Cowtown's owners and advocates, helped by the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, defied another modern trend by preserving 375 acres of pasture land that surrounds Cowtown. It's been under constant pressure from developers. You drive around here and you see houses and houses and houses is going up everywhere in developments. Whatever ridiculous price you put on a piece of ground, somebody would sign a contract. Um, and there's been a lot of temptations over the years. And what we do wouldn't happen without this land. The land is the key ingredient for our family's success over generations. The Harris family pastures 100 rodeo horses and three to 500 cattle here, and they'd retain ownership under the agreement. The two and a half million dollar easement restricts the land's use to grazing only, paid for with money from private foundations and through the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service grant for grasslands. It has to be well taken care of grassland, and also it's also a benefit to the up grass birds that that live in this area. It protects active farmland, it protects uh, critical land for endangered species, it protects a cultural heritage and viability of farming in this area, and it helps protect clean water by keeping the land undeveloped. It's the first federal grasslands conservation project in New Jersey, but it's also saving a ranching rodeo family's way of life. What's it worth to preserve a family legacy, you know? Cowtown's opening day is May 26th. That's when all of these guys will get back to work. Season runs through September. And thanks to this conservation agreement, Cowtown will not be riding into the stereotypic western sunset anytime soon. In Piles Grove Township, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. New Jersey's autism rate is one in 41 children, the highest of any state. Black residents of New Jersey are hospitalized for asthma at a rate that's four times higher than whites. 
Walmart has 73 stores in New Jersey as of September 2017. And Cowtown Rodeo in Salem County also features mutton busting, a sheep riding contest for kids. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Late word today that Camden City School District Superintendent Paymon Rahanafard is stepping down after five years. We'll have details tomorrow on NJTV News. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. See you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. In every county across the state. I do like that Horizon is a Jersey company. It's almost like a sports team for us. It's like ours. In sickness and in health. You never think it's going to happen to you, especially being so young. Horizon has been there for me through everything I've been through. With experience and stability, we're behind you. Yeah, we're hardworking people in New Jersey. Horizon gets us.